YouTubers, it's Fortune Cookie 45 LC coming to you from the Hot Lead Zone, and tonight's topic is a very important one, but it's not a very popular topic because I've done some videos on it before and they were not that popularly viewed. However, it's a very important topic, and that is lead exposure. And this was kicked off because Ruger Reaper asked a question Are you ever concerned about lead poisoning? And the answer is all the time. Well, I'd like to present some information to you that perhaps you don't see elsewhere on YouTube. And there are some very good videos on lead exposure and lead toxicity. You should see those. But you're going to hear some different stuff here. So let's begin by some frequently asked questions about lead exposure, lead toxicity. And one is, what are some of the ways that people get lead exposure, lead toxicity? And some of those ways are old pipes, paint, toys, tetraethyl lead gasoline, pewter, ceramics, stained glass, solder, cosmetics, imported food, imports, occupational reasons, such as plumbers, and then shooting. And then, of course, shooting is what concerns us most because that's what we're doing. And there are lots of new shooters, new reloaders, new bullet casters now. And this information can be very important for them as well as all of the rest of us. Another question is, what's the lead that concerns us most? Well, that's actually all lead. But what is especially dangerous is the lead that we can't see. And that's lead dust. So, how does lead, and especially lead dust, get into people? And there's three main, main ways, routes that lead gets in, and that is ingestion. That means it goes through the mouth. Inhalation means it's breathed in through the nose. Or absorption means it goes in through the skin. Those three ways are how we get the lead. Now, what levels are considered safe? And this is determined by a blood test for lead. And the answer is... Most people, even people who are not exposed to lead as a course of things, they'll have in their blood 2 micrograms per deciliter. Now, people who get some exposure, marginal, can have as much as 10 micrograms per deciliter. And then there's 80 to 100 micrograms per deciliter, and that's considered critical and treatment such as chelation therapy needs to be instituted for these kind of people at that level. Now, YouTubers, we cannot be in denial about the bad effects of lead in the bloodstream because there's all kinds of health issues that can come up. And there really haven't been any minimum levels established for lead to be safe. Even at 2 micrograms per deciliter, there's some work now that's being that's coming out that's saying that there are problems at two micrograms. Problem YouTubers is that it's not just ourselves personally because lead dust and lead doesn't have any brains. All it does is it gets everywhere it can. So what happens is we can actually become the transportation device to bring lead dust exposure to other people like other family members. And so our responsibility is not just to ourselves, but to those around us, our family members, and even our communities. Okay, so now you ask the question, what about shooting then? Because that's where our exposure is. Well, let's break that down. The exposure to lead and lead dust is in the actual shooting, and that's at ranges or in the outdoors, wherever it is but also in gun cleaning. Now it's also in reloading. And where that comes from is from fired brass and the reloading bench and reloading room. And finally there's bullet casting. And our exposure there is by the gathering of raw lead supplies where we, we might become exposed to lead and lead dust and also bear contact with lead either by touching lead bullets, lead ammunition, or contact with lead ingots and our cast bullets. So the question is, how do we protect ourselves and our families from lead exposure? And 
it's not that awful a situation. There are people that are getting bad exposure, and those are the range workers who are there all the time. And there are range professionals like teachers and educators, coaches, professional shooters. They're getting exposed a lot. But why wouldn't we want to protect ourselves even though our exposure may not be that bad? So we do want to protect ourselves so we can protect our families at the same time. Now, all shooting ranges have the same problem. And that is, every time a gun is fired, lead can be released from the primers and also from the bullets. Now, lead-free primers are available, but even if there were a ban on lead primers, it's going to be many years before those will run through the system. And most bullets contain lead. Even jacketed bullets or plated bullets can result in eventual lead exposure. And this is how it happens. By definition, shooting ranges have to stop the bullets. Well, they're either stopped by berms or armor plate. Now what happen, happens with berms is that years of impacts with bullets will result in the lead getting into the soil and the lead being ground into very fine dust and the dirt ground into fine dust by the impact of the bullets hitting years and years and years of impacts by lead bullets and even jacketed bullets which will tear open and may have soft points, the lead still gets into the soil and gets ground into fine dust. Now, armor plate defeats bullets by smashing the bullets and causing lead particles and atomization and fracturing up, grinding up the, the lead into fine particles. And that gets into the soil around the armor plate gets into the air around the armor plate that might even hang there if the wind conditions are right so that shooters coming down to change targets will get exposed to some of that lead in the air just by hitting armor plate or even hitting berms because you've seen bullets hitting berms and you see the dust that's raised up by the impact of the bullet we don't need to show you pictures of that happening because you've seen it now that lead dust will get all the way back to the shooting line because the guns release lead particles from the muzzle and from flash gaps and this kind of thing. And some of the lead dust gets on the guns and gets onto the shooting benches. The blast, sideways blast gets on the partitions. And so if you assay the area around the shooting stations, there's going to be lead there. And shooters will be exposed to that, exposed to the dust when they change targets, gets in their clothes, and as we, you go home, even after you wash your hands, you go home, that lead dust is in the clothes, gets in the car, and is actually brought into the house, might expose other family members to that lead dust. So a nice solution would be to bring a change of clothes or wear some coveralls, and when you get back to your car, Get a trash bag, take off your outer clothing, whether it's a sweatshirt or a coverall, put that into the a trash bag, take your shoes off, put that into the trash bag, seal the trash bag up, and then put on a different pair of shoes so you don't contaminate the car or the house when you get home. And when you get home, go ahead and clean your guns with good ventilation because you're going to have lead exposure there. Do it outside or do it with good ventilation and then shower afterwards. A lot of us don't shower when we get back from the shooting range. We should because that's what workers do when they work at the range. Now once you have two or three bags of range clothes in those trash bags, just go ahead and take it to a laundromat, throw it in and throw in your dollar and change or whatever it is and clean that clothes up dry it, take it home, and that's your shooting range clothes, and use it just for that. 
you're good. Now watch out for some indoor ranges. A lot of them have problems with their ventilation systems, there are dead air spaces, this kind of thing. So check with the range masters, make sure that the indoor range that you're attending is good and safe to do. There are shooters that avoid all indoor ranges because they just don't feel that they're safe in terms of lead exposure. Now shooters, talk about reloading. The problem with reloading is that we're dealing with fired brass and the fired brass contains lead toxicity from primers and also from lead bullets that are rubbing on the way out of the case on firing. So the fighter brass, when we, we put that fire brass into our vibratory case cleaners and we tumble them, guess what happens? By definition, the vibration and the smashing of the media together with all the, all the brass in there to get the brass polished causes a fine dust. And that dust turns black after a while and guess what that is? You got a lot of lead in there. And you know, I don't need to show you this, you know when you dump that that media out of there, a cloud of very fine dust comes up. And that is a hazard. Do that outside. Make sure you have wind blowing away from you when you do that, or you will be exposed. Now, it doesn't stop there. We take that fire brass inside, and that fire brass has a very thin coating of that dust on there. So when we handle that, br that brass as we're reloading, it gets on our fingers, and as we're working our presses, it gets into the air, and oftentimes our nose is right there. So that you're getting exposed to the lead from the lead dust right there in our reloading room. Same problem also. That dust also gets in our hair, gets in our clothes, and we're going to go out and, and uh, take a break from our reloading to have dinner. We're going to wash our hands, right? But are you going to change clothes? Are you going to take a shower? Oftentimes, we'll just go ahead and pick up the baby. And you got dust on your clothes. Not a good idea. No problem. What you do is you plan your reloading sessions so you don't need to take a break. Just finish up. And same idea. Have a change of clothes that you only wear in your reloading room, put that into a trash bag, and change out of there, go ahead and take a shower, and then go ahead and do your family activities. While you're reloading, to, pre to protect yourself, wear a respirator that's been rated for lead. That way, any dust gets into the air, no problem. But then, Look at reloading bench and room design. Lots of YouTube videos on how to design a, a reloading bench and a reloading room. And we talk about lighting and this kind of thing, but we don't think about ventilation. Oftentimes our reloading rooms, our reloading areas, are in secluded areas, like underneath stairs, in the, in the farthest corner of the garage, this kind of thing, because we want to get it out of the way, not where the family is, Use, use some space that's not used for anything else. Well, those spaces are oftentimes very poorly ventilated. You need to add some ventilation, even forced ventilation, powerful vacuum suction fan blowing that air out of there to protect ourselves from exposure. And wear a respirator. Plus, wear some good nitrile gloves. Like to thank Vengeance Early for recommending some gloves that are available at Home Depot. They're extra thick nitrile gloves. They're black and I forgot what they're called. Monkey gloves or something like that. But they're great. Go to Home Depot and ask them for the thick nitrile gloves. And that'll protect you from any exposure from direct contact with cast bullets, lead dust, this kind of thing. When you're done, you just peel them off, throw them away, good to go. YouTubers, we gotta break off part two now because this video is getting too long. Please do look at part two because you're gonna find interesting stuff here as well as important information. Bye for now.